We are in Genesis, the eighth chapter. We are continuing the flood narrative. Let me once again emphasize that this is not a recapitulation of Babylonian flood stories, as skeptical scholars have tried to point out. There are certain similarities between the Enuma Elish and this account in Genesis, but there are very significant differences, big differences, in fact. And that's often not pointed out by the skeptics. Uh, but there are significant differences because what, M what Moses is doing is telling us exactly what happened. And he is, does not have an agenda, as it were, except to point out what God did, as opposed to what the Babylonian flood narrative uh, claimed about it. Uh, what we have in Genesis is a simple, straightforward telling of what took place. And so at the end of chapter 7, we saw that the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. For 110 days after the flood ceased, after the rain, that is, ceased to fall, the waters continued to rise on the earth. Forty days and forty nights, the fountains of the earth were opened up from underneath, and the windows of heaven, as it were, were opened, and all the water came flooding from, from beneath and crashing down from above. And after that forty-day period, when it ended, the water continued to rise. Now that's an amazing thing to think about, that all this flood water was far above the highest mountain peaks. Uh, and it's not a, glo a localized flood, as some would say. This is a universal flood. This is a universal flood that covered all the earth. And so chapter 8 begins, But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. So this wind passes. We're not told how strong this wind was. We're not told from what direction the wind came. We just are told that God caused this wind to pass over the earth. It was a continual wind to subside that water, to calm the water, if you will. The water, of course, had been uh, raging and the seas raging and the flood wind or the flood uh, tides coming up and the, uh, the waves crashing down upon the ark and the ark never sunk. It was built to float. So it was able to survive all of that. But now the water subsides. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and the rain from the sky was restrained. So God causes all of this to cease. And the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. So after 150 days, the water starts to go down. In the seventh month... The, on the 17th day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, where is Ararat? The best we can tell, it's in modern-day Armenia. However, the claims that some have made that they have found Noah's ark are bogus. Completely bogus. In fact, if you ask anyone that's involved in legitimate archaeology, they will call such claims ark, A-R-K, archaeology. In other words, it's fake. Uh, as much as I would like to believe that there is remnants and uh, uh, shards of Noah's ark on the highest mountains in Armenia, uh, I doubt that tremendously. And if it were to come out, that ark, the ark is still up there somehow. Don't you know the Roman Catholic Church will turn it into a shrine? That's what they do with everything else. They turn it into a holy place, a shrine. Well, that's what they would do if they were able to find Noah's ark up there. And I don't have to know that there are shreds or, or, or remnants of Noah's ark on the top of Mount Ararat to prove 
to me that the Bible's true. The Bible's true anyway. But the fact is, if you are, have faith in the Word of God, then you know it happened. Whether or not they find any kind of remnants of Noah's Ark up there. Yes, sir. Exactly. And that, you know, the Shroud of Turin, that question is something that's a whole other kettle of fish. Uh, I have my se severe questions about the Shroud of Turin but simply based on what the Gospel of John says. John says that Jesus' body was wrapped in a shroud and his head was wrapped in a separate headpiece. But what do we see when we see a picture of the shroud? It's one shroud from head to foot with an image of a man all the way. Well, that's not what my Bible tells me. My Bible tells me that the head was wrapped separate from the shroud itself. Well, the fact is there's a lot of evidence both ways as to whether it could be from the first century or from the Middle Ages. My hunch, and this all it is is a hunch, is that the Shroud of Turin was one of the earliest attempts at photography that's ever been made. And it was Leonardo da Vinci, I think, that did it. Leonardo da Vinci was a genius in so many ways. He was not a New Testament Christian, obviously. But he was a genius in a lot of different areas, and I would not be shocked if that was one of, his, one of the earliest attempts by him to do some sort of photography. But as it is, as, as was pointed out, we don't have to have that to know what the Bible says to be true. And that's the case here. The, mount, the mountains, notice the mountains, plural, of Ararat, he doesn't specify which one, is where the ark rested. The water decreased steadily until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Can you imagine that kind of flood? Where on the tenth month, after it's been ceased raining for a long time, then you start to see the tops of the mountains. That's a lot of water. That's deep. That's deep flood. Then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. And he sent out a raven... And it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. The Hebrew text indicates that the raven would fly and then come back. In other words, he wasn't flitting from place to place, resting. No, he would fly out and then he would come back. He would fly out and then he would come back. Fly out and he would come back. And then it says, he sent out a dove uh, from, from, uh, from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. So she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So the dove couldn't find any place to rest. She had to come back to the ark, and so she bring, he brings her in. So he waited yet another seven days. He waits another week, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. So that dove has now found vegetation. Vegetation is beginning to spring up from below the surface. That indicates that the water is steadily decreasing, steadily going down. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove. But she did not return to him again. The dove found her a home. She found her a place to rest, and she didn't have to come back to the ark. Now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. So we're talking about a full solar year, 371 days as a solar year. 
And so after all that period of time, after all this period of time that the water has subsided and that the rains had stopped and that the wind has been blowing all over the earth, now the ground is dry. The Hebrew text indicates not only was the ground dry, it was firm, dry and firm. If you ever go out in your backyard after a big rain, you know that if you go immediately out there, what's going to happen? You're going to be in a lot of mud. You're going to be in a lot of sloshy, sloshy ground. But if you wait for the sun to come out and the wind to start blowing, after a while that ground becomes firm. Well, this way it is here. He finds that the ground was dry. It was dry and firm. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. So it's ready now to be populated. Then God spoke to Noah saying, go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. That same phrase, be fruitful and multiply, that God had said in chapter 1, verse 22, now he repeats here, for uh, the animals, all flesh that is with them. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creepy thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by their families from the ark. So all the two-by-two two animals and all of the clean animals by their sevens go out by their families. They go out in their own groups. And <coughs> So that says, <coughs> excuse me, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is the first mention in the Bible of the word altar. Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. There's where we know why the clean animals were chosen. So that Noah and his family could offer sacrifice. They offer animal sacrifice. And it says, uh, the Lord smelled the soothing aroma. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma. This is what we call an anthropomorphism. That is to say, you're attributing to God human characteristics so we can identify with him. God doesn't have nostrils. He doesn't have a physical body, obviously. He doesn't smell as we think of smelling. It simply indicates here that it pleased him. It pleased God. So the Lord smelled the aroma, the soothing aroma. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. Here's part of the reason why God has not directly intervened in all the atrocities that have taken place since the time of Jesus in the church. He has not intervened in the, as far as wiping out, directly wiping out empires and uh, evil regimes and evil dictators because he has made that promise. I will never again uh, curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth and I will never again destroy every living thing. Now God did intervene, as we know during the period of the Israelites, uh, to subdue Israel's enemies and also to uh, take the promised land. But as far as wiping out regimes consistently all throughout history, he has not done that and he has not wiped out the evil from mankind as he did here. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. I know that global warming is false because of what he says right here. This uh, claim by the environmentalist wackos that we're going to destroy the world through our own efforts is false. 
the claim that some made years ago when the Soviet Union was at its peak that we would destroy the world by nuclear war is false. There could be a nuclear war. It could have devastating effects. Don't get me wrong. But as far as destroying the earth completely, that's God's prerogative, not man's. God will do that at the end of time or when he decides the time is up and we are to enter into judgment. But yet here, he makes it very clear that the seasons will never cease. So this idea that we're going to have global warming to the extent that you see on that movie, The Day After Tomorrow, and I've seen The Day After Tomorrow, so you won't have to, by the way. <clears throat> it's it's uh, got great special effects. That's about the only thing you can say about it. But it is the environmentalist wacko uh, doomsday scenario. That in the movie 2012. You remember the earth was supposed to end in 2012, right? The Mayans, I believe, or the Aztecs had predicted supposedly that the earth would end at 2012. Well, it came and went. We're still here. Uh, you know, all of these doomsday scenarios that we're going to destroy the planet ourselves fall flat. Completely fall flat. Uh, or while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. Yes, sir. That's right. You are absolutely right. God's all over it all. God's in control of it. As long as God's in control, I don't have to worry. Now, does that mean that I'm absolved at all, of all responsibility for caring for this earth? No. I've got to tend and care for the earth and not abuse it. That doesn't give me carte blanche to do whatever I want to. Don't get me wrong, please. We've got to tend to what the Lord has entrusted to all of us. Let me make that very clear. But the idea that mankind has within his power to destroy the earth through his own ends, that's just attributing to man the power that God only has. God's got that power. We don't. I remember Time Magazine had a front page article, for a cover story in the 1970s talking about how global cooling is going to destroy the earth. We're going to be in an ice age. Within a few years, it was not global cooling in an ice age. Now it's global warming. We're all going to burn up. So what is it? Which is it? Well, now they're sort of shifting back. Well, we're going to go into an ice age. Well, get with the program, you know. Which, which is it? Be consistent. Well, the fact is, we can't do that. God only can. But having said that, we've got to tend to what the Lord has entrusted to us and not abuse it. Because we'll be held accountable for the what we have done, what the Lord has entrusted to our hands. Any other questions or comments before we get into chapter 9? Chapter 9, verse 1 says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He repeats the blessing given to Adam, to Noah and his sons. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. He wants the earth to be populated, in other words. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given. Now, this is interesting. This fear that the Lord puts in animals of man likely is done to... Uh, fostered the protection of man to protect him and also to protect the animals for that, to that, for that matter. Um, the fear. There is a certain fear in the wild, a certain hesitation uh, as far as animals are concerned with man and man likewise with the animals. And the Lord put that there for a purpose. Apparently up to this point there was no fear that existed. There was no fear that existed between man and the animals, at least to the extent that it is uh, given here in chapter 9. Uh, and that's an interesting thing to think about. 
uh, because of what happened with the previous generation that was wiped out. Could it be that man abused that in his drive to, to uh, satisfy his own urges and his own lusts? We're not told. It could be part of it. But at any rate, this fear is placed. And then look at verse 3. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. This is the first divine sanction about eating meat. That is, God grants man the right to eat meat. There's nothing wrong with it. There are those today that would say it is wrong, it's a sin to eat animal meat. No, it's not. Not at all. Uh, it's a choice whether or not one eats meat or is a, is a vegetarian. Uh, that's a choice. And Paul makes it very clear in Romans 13 that that is a matter of indifference to God. We make a choice and we can't bind our preference on that area on someone else. I love to eat meat. I make very clear. But if someone does not want to eat meat and wants to eat all vegetables, that's fine. I don't have any problem at all with that. But here's where we find that God first gives his, uh, his uh, approval to this. Only, verse 4, you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Here we see the first prohibition about eating blood and by implication drinking blood and you say who would want to do that well you'd be surprised you'd be surprised not just vampires in fiction there's people that want to eat and drink blood that's I mean I don't understand it but it happens but here the Lord says to Noah and his family no you can't you can't and this is not just for Noah and his family. This prohibition is for all human history. How do I know that? I know that because in Leviticus chapter 17, as we will see once we get to that point, a while from now, <laughs> uh, Moses, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, prohibits the Israelites from eating blood and drinking blood. Then you come down to the New Testament in Acts 15 and the first inspired letter that is penned by the brethren that met in Jerusalem about circumcision, what is one of the prohibitions that they place in that letter? Eating blood. Eating things that are strangled and blood. This prohibition is in every age of human history. Here we see it in patriarchy. Noah was a patriarch after all. We see it here in patriarchy. We see, we see it in Leviticus 17. In the Mosaic age, the prohibition is given. And then we see it in the Christian age in Acts 15, the prohibition is given. Uh, eating and drinking blood, because that's where the life is, as God tells Noah. Verse 5, surely I will acquire your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. It is interesting to me that here when Noah and his family disembarked from the ark, one of the first things that God tells Noah and his family is that if someone kills another human being, they are to be killed. Capital punishment. Capital punishment is ordained here by God, as it would be in the Mosaic age, and as I firmly believe it is in the Christian age, Romans 13. Uh, he beareth not the sword in vain, Paul says about the civil government. Civil government has the right to take the life of an evildoer that is uh, convicted uh, and proven to have taken the life of someone. Civil government has that right to do that. Uh, capital punishment in every age is ordained by the Lord because of the sacredness of life. The sacredness of human life is affirmed by God right here. 
Uh, this is to prevent the lawlessness that took place that happened before the flood. Every thought and intent of man's heart was evil continually. You know, I, I told you before that Brenda and I had this habit now of watching Dateline. Dateline, uh, NBC, you know, and they have all these uh, cases, murder cases. Well, we've gotten the habit now, we watch that in 2020 a lot. And uh, we get fascinated by these cases, you know, how complex they get and who done it and what, what happens and all this. Well, you know, you get so wrapped up in that, you think, is everybody like this? Uh, but still, uh, these kind of cases the, where you take the life of someone else, that's the ultimate violation of a human being, the ultimate. And justice demands that punishment be served on those that do that. And that's the reason why we have the judicial system as we have it. Why civil government, one of the main reasons why civil government is in place is to protect those who abide by the law and prosecute those who violate that law. And this is the principle right here that is set forth by God. For in the image of God he made man. All of us no matter who we are, are made in God's image after his likeness. That is, we have an eternal side that will live on forever. We have the breath of life flowing through our bodies. The blood is flowing in our veins that keeps us in existence. God instituted all that. It's sacred. We need to make sure it is kept sacred. As for you, he says in verse 7, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Again, he repeats the Adamic blessing. Be fruitful and multiply. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you. Here's the first mention of covenant. My covenant, an agreement between two parties, one greater than the other. And with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that comes out of the ark, even every beast of the earth, I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood, neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. Never again. Never again will the earth be destroyed by a flood as he did here. This is for all generations. All generations of man until the end of time, this is in place. And then verse 12. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. We have a song in our psalm book that sometimes we have sung over the years. God made a rainbow in the cloud. God made a rainbow. Why did he make it? He made it to remember the agreement, the covenant that he had made with man to never again destroy the earth. That's the purpose of the rainbow. The rainbow is a sign of hope for mankind. It is not a sign for the approval of homosexuality. And it is tragic to me that the rainbow sign has been co-opted for that purpose. It has been co-opted by those that want to legitimize sinful practices in the earth. God makes it clear why the rainbow is in place. The rainbow is in place to remember the covenant that he made with man to never again destroy the earth with a flood. And that's what we've got to know. And that's what we've got to emphasize and stress. That's not a 
politically correct thing to say. But I don't really care because it's what the Bible says. The Bible says it. Any questions, comments, disagreements? All right. Verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Notice the three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. And then he says, Ham was the father of Canaan. Now why does he mention that? Because of what's going to take place here in the next few verses. Canaan is prominent in the next several verses for a certain reason, which he's going to bring forth. These three, from these three come the population of the earth. Now some have speculated in the past that Shem, Ham, and Japheth are the progenitors of the three major races in the earth. I don't believe that. I do not believe that. Uh, the thing is, the Bible doesn't tell us how the races came about. All we can do is speculate. Our friends at Apologetics Press have done genetic charts as far as the pigmentation of mankind, how that could have come about, but that only ex explains one aspect of the racial differences that we have. Uh, we simply don't know, and we can't say, because the Bible doesn't say. It's just a fact. It's a fact, and the Lord wants us all to live together in, uh, and try to do good to each other and to love one another and to spread the gospel to each other. That's what we've got to do. But here we find that the three sons come off the ark with their families, and then verse 20 says, Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He was the first vine dresser mentioned in Scripture. He has a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. All of a sudden, boom, we see this. What is this? Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. According, just did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah followed the, the Lord's advice, or Lord's uh, uh, precepts and instructions to the T, and now he's out of the ark and he uh, makes his vineyard after he gets settled, and then all of a sudden he gets drunk. This is not by far the last time we're going to see Moses pointed out the flaws of these men as well as their, as well as their strengths. Noah, this great man, this man of faith, this man who had grace shown to him, gets drunk. Apparently, Noah was unaware of what fermented wine could do. We're not told that, but it seems to be the case. Perhaps he found that these grapes were sweet and he decided to make some, some uh, juice and then he lets that set out for a while and it gets fermented and he starts drinking it and the more he drinks, the more he becomes intoxicated. Not aware of that. But as it is, he uncovered himself inside his tent. Alcohol can make you do things you would never do in your life before. How many times have we seen that happen? Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. Ham, apparently, not, we're not told by Moses his disposition when he told his brothers. We're not, we're not dis, have described his uh, facial expression. But my hunch, and it's all it is, is a hunch. My hunch is that Ham somehow rejoiced or gloried in it. He was really making fun of his father, it seems. Uh, I could be off base about that. But for some reason, Ham is singled out as having done Noah wrong. Could it be that he just sort of had a, had a fun with it and was just really uh, uh, trying, to, trying to really say something about his father to his brothers? 
We're not really told that. We're just say we just we're just said that he just says that he told his two brothers. So they cover his father. Verse twenty four. When Noah awoke from his wine, when he finally comes to himself, when he's sober, he sobers up. He knew what his youngest son had done to him. That is, he had brought shame upon Noah in some way. And by what he did in exposing what Noah had done to his brothers, bringing shame upon him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. This is fulfilled in the Canaanites. Obviously, you see Canaan. That's a descendant of Ham. Cursed be Canaan. He's going to be a servant. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. From Shem comes Abram and Israel. So he's saying that Canaan is going to be the servant of Shem. We see that fulfilled, do we not? Later on, when Israel enters into the land of Canaan by uh, God's command, what do they do? They subdue the land. They don't wipe out completely all the tribes, but they do subdue it and control it. Canaan is a servant to Shem, the descendants, that is. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Again, that is fulfilled. So we see that fulfilled in Scripture. The use that some have made of this passage to try to justify some sort of perpetual subservient role in certain groups of people is simply without basis. It's not has does not have any basis here. Because this applies to Canaan. This applies to their descendants that we see fulfilled in the Old Testament. Has no bearing on today's circumstances. Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So after the flood is over, he lives another 350 years, and it says all the days of Noah were 950 years. Methuselah lived 969 years. Well, Noah wasn't too far behind him. 950 years and he died. <laughs> that phrase, always, and he died. Well, that's the way of all the earth. That's the, re, that's the uh, consequence, one of the consequences of Adam's sin is that death has passed upon all men for all have sinned. Now, interesting about this, Abram that we're going to be introduced to uh, beginning at the end of chapter 10 into chapter 11, Abram was born 292 years after the flood, if you do the math. So that means that Noah was a contemporary of Abram for 58 years. The first 58 years that Abram lived, he lived alongside Noah. Could it be that Noah taught Abram the way of the Lord that he taught him about the one true God I have a hunch and that's all it is a hunch I have a hunch that that's what happened that's where Abram got the idea that there's only one God as we're going to see Terah is Abram's father we're later told in the Old Testament that Terah was an idolater he was an idol worshiper when he was in Ur of the Chaldees and yet his son, Abram, by the time we first meet him, is already, he already has a relationship with God where God speaks to him and he speaks to God directly. How did that come about? I have a hunch that it was because of Noah. Noah taught Abram the right way for the first 58 years of his life. So, any questions or comments about this? Oh, we've got about five minutes left. First bell as if on cue. Any comments or questions? We've got to make sure uh, whenever we deal with Scripture that we keep in the context of Scripture. That's the reason why I mentioned what I did about uh, the curse of 
of uh, Canaan or the curse of Ham that was placed upon Canaan. We need to make sure we keep it in the context and not go far afield because that's where some have gone over the years with that. We need to make sure it doesn't apply to areas that it doesn't apply to. Well, that's what we're trying to do here because we know from what the Old Testament tells us that this was fulfilled exactly as God told Noah. All right, so next week we will begin again with chapter 10.